What's it look like now, number one? Clear and solid, sir. Slight Doppler. Must be a U-boat. Still moving left? Yes. There are some men in the water just about there. Jack Hawkins in his most famous role, Captain Erickson in The Cruel Sea. Hawkins was not, I think, a great film actor. He was typecast too often for that. But in his own land and in his own time, he was a great film star. In the 1920s and 30s, he'd been a stage actor of considerable versatility. But once he made his career in films, his range inevitably narrowed. Cinema audiences expect the familiar from their movie stars. And what they expected from Hawkins was manly emotion and a stiff upper lip and nobody ever presented these things to the world with greater conviction. In the words of his friend Peter O'Toole, he was the male Britannia, and at the height of his career, he faced the appalling loss of his voice through cancer of the throat with the courage one would expect of the male Britannia. You see, I was barely coming up to a peak in my career, I think. And, of course, that was cut off. Well, I had to settle for something less. Hawkins talking soon after his operation in what he always called his Dalek voice. He was born here in Wood Green, London, on September the 14th, 1910, the son of a local builder, and was known to his family as the afterthought because he was the youngest by ten years of four children. At eight, he was a member of the church choir. At twelve, he was in the local operatic society's production of the Pirates of Penzance. No hint of the male Britannia there. From the age of five, he attended the school beside the church. He was a great schoolboy, you know. He was always immaculately dressed. He had a blazer and, and, uh, and a short trousers and shining knees, scrub, well scrubbed knees. He was a scholarship boy at school and um, he never took it up because, as you probably know, he started on stage when he was 13. This was purely accidental, the whole thing. Otherwise, I think he would have had an academic career. An early talent for amateur theatricals took young Jack into the Wood Green Red Caps, a junior concert party, and from there, at the suggestion of a neighbour, to an audition for the Italia Conti Drama School's end-of-year production of Where the Rainbow Ends. He was accepted, and at the school met his fellow pupil, Sidney Bromley. Uh, he, was in the, he was in a couple of things before he played the uh, leading characters, but he was a natural. I don't remember him ever in a, a class. I first saw him as a boy. He must have been eight or ten years younger than I. And I saw the first night of St. Joan with Sybil Thornback at the New Theatre in 1924. And he played the little page who uh, jumps up and finds the flag has changed, the wind has changed for the battle scene. And he made a great success in that. Life as a boy actor, however, was not all earnest endeavour, as Sidney Bromley recalls. Sometimes we go to Tottenham Court Road and there were these little shops that used to sell these gadgets and things. So with our threepence, we bought some stink bombs. And then Jack said, well, I've got a great idea. Let's um, let one off outside the next dressing room. But we didn't know about gas. It's heavier than air. So it was going down, down, down the staircase and onto the stage. And do you know the stage was full, full of this uh, terrible stink? When he was only 18, Hawkins came to New York to appear on Broadway in the play Journey's End. Originally, he was to have taken the leading role, but unfortunately for him, the producer discovered how young he really was and decided, not unreasonably, I suppose, that he really couldn't risk the success or failure of his production riding on the shoulders of a mere boy. So Hawkins was demoted to the second leading role. Now, this was in 1929, the age of prohibition and the eve of the great Wall Street crash, an exciting time to be in New York, and much happened to young Master Hawkins. Hawkins. For a start, he discovered how to make bathtub gin, a potentially lethal enterprise. But also, and rather less perilously, I imagine, he lost his virginity, to which, as he confessed later in his autobiography, he'd hitherto clung with a tenacity that puzzled even himself. Furthermore, he fell in love with a young English actress who was in another British production on Broadway. And when she returned to England, he left the cast of Journey's End and pursued her ardently. But in London, the ardour swiftly died and the romance just as swiftly broke up. Indeed, six months later, when he was in the play Autumn Crocus in the West End, he met the actress who was to become his first wife, Jessica Tandy. Well, he was great fun to be with and a very fascinating young man, too. I mean, all the girls were mad about him. And uh, we had a lot of laughs together and had a wonderful time. And I was very much in love with him. He was wonderful company. And he had... His friends were from all 
walks of life. I mean, he was a very gregarious man. In those days, was there any sign of trouble with his throat? That was his Achilles heel, if you can have a heel in your throat. I saw him one day doing this. I said, what are you doing? He said, I've been to the doctor about my throat. And the doctor told me that if never to rub my throat, but to always massage it in an upward direction. Coincidentally, perhaps, Hawkins throughout his life had trouble with his throat, but in those early days, no doubt, he thought little of it. His theatrical career, begun in childhood without hardship or struggle, continued to prosper. He did some really wonderful things. I, I thought he was the best Leontes I'd ever seen. He was absolutely breathtaking uh, in The Winter's Tale. He could play modern stuff most awfully well. He was a very good comedian. And then when he played Edmund in King Lear, which Granville Barker directed in the first year of the war, at the old Vic, Barker was absolutely delighted with him, gave him humor, and uh, Jack jumped at everything he said and was so alive and uh, uh, full of variety of tone and voice and, and great virility. In 1933, the drama critic of the London Evening News nominated Gielgud, Robert Donat, and Ralph Richardson as stars of the future and added, perhaps they'll all be outstripped by Mr. Jack Hawkins, who's only 23. Not at all a bad tipster, that one. Meanwhile, Hawkins' film career had already begun, not with a bang, but a whimper, in Birds of Prey. Autumn Crocus, in 1934, was Hawkins' eighth film in four years. But as he said later about this period of his life, one tended to regard films as second-rate compared to the live theatre, and little more than a means of paying one's income tax. Do you know anything about psychoanalysis? Certainly not. Look here, would you like us to lend you a few books on psycho? You'd find it a great help in the parish. Oh, thank you, but I hardly feel like tackling anything heavy on my holiday. Oh, we'll start you off on something quite light. In fact, I've written a little book myself. It's called A Remedy for Sex. Oh, isn't that rather drastic? Death at Broadcasting House also made its contribution towards the Hawkins tax bill and possibly helps to explain why he said, I never imagined my greatest fame would be earned on the screen. What do you think you're doing? I might ask you that question. A little detective work. What's your explanation? About the fame? I've discovered the murderer's gloves. Murderers were notoriously careless with their gloves in that kind of film. Meanwhile, Hawkins' domestic life was showing signs of strain. He and Jessica Tandy had a daughter, Susan, who was born in 1931. But the marriage had not been too successful, and by the time war was declared in 1939, they were heading towards divorce. What, what I think is significant is that, that each of us later made good and lasting marriages. So I think probably we both learned a great deal from our disappointments in that relationship. When France had fallen and Dunkirk had been evacuated and he still hadn't received his call-up papers, Hawkins decided to volunteer for the armed services. But incredibly, at that time nobody was very much interested in volunteers and he had the dickens of a job even getting into the army. But once accepted, he was swiftly sent off to officer's training school and after that he was seconded to the army film unit to make a propaganda picture called Next of Kin. Well, he was quite pleased about that because he looked forward to augmenting his second lieutenant's pittance with an acting fee. Unfortunately, however, the army wasn't in the habit of paying acting fees and nor was it about to pay for the digs for the actor. So there was Hawkins, the star of the film, rubbing along on £3.17 shillings a week and paying £7 a week to put up at the Savage Club in order to be conveniently on hand for the filming. When the picture was finally over, as he reported later in his autobiography, I returned to my regiment up to my neck in debt. Next of Kin was Hawkins' first film in uniform, the first of many which typecast him as a warrior. All right. You're the security man, aren't you? Yes, that's right. We were expecting you. My name's Harcourt, you know. This is Johnston, our intelligence officer. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Well, you'd better see the Brigadier right away. He'll be free in a minute. Good. Well, by the way, I just ticked off that sentry of yours just now. He never asked me for my pass. Well, he doesn't know me from Adam. I hope you don't mind. No, oh, not at all. He ought to know him better. I'll talk to his CEO. Shortly after Next of Kin, Hawkins was sent to India where he learned that Jessica Tandy had divorced him and where the army, having trained him fully in jungle warfare, decided he was now fit to run troop entertainments. In the fullness of time, he rose to the rank of colonel in charge of ENSA for the whole of Southeast Asia. And it was while performing this office in Bombay that he met another young actress who was to become his second wife. Her name was Doreen Lawrence. I saw this um, very tall, very broad figure coming through the door 
and uh, his walk, which is always, uh, well, became quite famous later in uniform, came s absolutely stamping in. And he was looking quite smashing. <laughs> he always wore uniform well. <laughs> Within 10 days, we realized that we'd um, fallen very much in love. In fact, we were already talking about marriage. At the end of the war, Hawkins returned to the stage as King Magnus in Shaw's play The Apple Cart, followed this up with a theatre tour of Europe sponsored by the British Council, and then appeared in repertory at the Piccadilly Theatre in London. It was there that he was spotted by Sir Alexander Corder, who was sufficiently impressed to offer him a three-year film contract. The money was good, but even by the standards of those days, not fantastic. £5,000 a year rising to £10,000 a year. But Hawkins accepted with pleasure, alacrity, and some surprise, because earlier he'd been told that he had entirely the wrong shaped face for the cinema screen. If you see pictures of Jack when he's very young, he's very tall and slim, and that strong jaw and, you know, rather thin face. Actually, my younger son looks quite like him, as he did then. But after the war, all that army training, no doubt, and square bashing that he had to do, um, broadened him out, and he, he was a different sort of person in shape and in stature, face, he obviously had a very good instinct for the camera, because he wasn't all that handsome, but it was a strong, good face. Corder's offer, therefore, presented him with another opportunity to break into films after his few halting attempts in the late 1930s. And even more agreeably, it meant that he could now afford to marry Doreen, and this he did at Chelsea Registry Office in 1947. You see, Jack had been married before, and uh, he had a daughter by his first marriage whom he hadn't seen since she was a little girl, and he really longed to have a family. So we started having a baby very quickly, and Nicky was born like 10 or 11 months after we were married. In fact, Nicky was born about the time his father started making this film for Corder, The Elusive Pimpernel, a lavish and costly production very different from the low-budget quickies Hawkins had made in the 1930s. By the time it was finished, he had a second son, Andrew, as well. <laughs> ah, Blakey, I heard you had Brinker with you. What do you think of the new jacket he's made for me? Good man, very good. <laughs> well, Blakeney, your opinion, man. A anything wrong? Did you know him well when you were young? Well, I, I could have known him better, I'm sure, had, had he been less successful and less busy. Because... Uh, he often was away filming in foreign parts or indeed when he was filming at the studio. I mean, one wouldn't see him for days on end. I suppose every small child is uh, in awe of their father. Um, I mean, he was a big man. Um, <laughs> he had a fairly formidable temper, which I dare say other people may have preferred to. Suddenly, this wild man was at me, and he was a powerful man, and he was articulate, too. And that reserve had gone completely, and I knew that he'd give me a belt in the face quite shortly. And he knew that I'd give him one, too, and that didn't faze him. His complexion would change colour. It, it would kind of veer towards being a sort of tawny port colour or something. <laughs> I think the only time I've ever seen him really completely blow his top with us was when I, uh, my brother and myself, chopped down a tree in the garden. He just, very quietly, but obviously almost white with anger, just went into us and told us about the waste of cutting down something that was living and that was beautiful. I mean, it wasn't a case of saying, you bloody idiots, why did you chop it down? It's going to make a great hole in the garden, etc., etc. It was much more about um, destroying life, really. Nineteen fifty one found Hawkins back in uniform, RAF uniform, this time in Angels One Five, in which he played a station commander during the Battle of Britain. You were lucky to get it back, Peter. Oh, she'll be all right, sir. Take more than that knockout, Daisy. I'm not so worried about aircraft. At a pinch, we can go after them in Tiger Moth arms with hand grenades. Pilots, we need so desperately. Well, the OTUs are turning out good stuff, sir. The last three VRs I had are shaping well. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. And it's not enough, Peter. It's not enough. 
The output isn't making up for the wastage. Your six short beeswax are four, and the Spitfire boy is almost as bad. And what's the answer? Make better use of what we've got. The M.O. says the bed will be fit for operations in a couple of days. That'll give you one more. The following year, Hawkins gave a notable performance far removed from wartime heroics in Mandy, the story of a little deaf girl. The film was produced by my father, Leslie Norman, who, ironically, has since had to undergo the same throat operation as Hawkins did. How did Jack feel about acting with the children? Like every other actor, a bit scared because children feel things. But my third time, of course, Jack didn't give a damn. He loved them. They suggested that we should work in, uh, in a real school with real deaf and dumb children. And those children are so extraordinary and so heartbreaking in a way that nobody could not be moved by them. And Jack was as moved as any. Listen to what answer can I give to that? The uh, uh, screenplay was written by Nigel Balchon. Uh, he said it was a character who's rather sort of shabby um, individual, not particularly uh, um, self-assertive, not in any way heroic, but that had a sort of brusque honesty. And this seemed to fit so much what we had both encountered in Jack's personality. It's against the rules of the school to take day pupils. Except in special cases and at the discretion of the headmaster. This is a special case, and I happen to be the headmaster. The child needs my help. The mother needs help. I'm going to give it to them. That's what I'm here for. I didn't think it was a good part at all um, for somebody who wanted to be a leading man. But I think that was the attractive thing about uh, uh, Jack, that he thought the part was a good one uh, and wanted it because it was a good part. Um, not because he was building up uh, a persona of any kind that would be appealing at the box office. Eyes. I nose nose yeah yeah nose nose <laughs> Indeed, his performance in Mandy was impressive enough to win him the much-coveted role of Captain Ericsson in the film version of Nicholas Montserrat's The Cruel Sea, still probably the finest British novel about the Second World War. And this, too, was produced by my father. Get any tired of it? A bit, sir. Well, she keeps still just for a minute or so. Well, at least we're dry. We'd know all about it if we had to turn round and steam into it. Yes, sir. The Cruelty was Hawkins' 30th film and finally established him as Britain's leading, leading man. It was not, however, a comfortable picture to make. Well, Jack was like me. We got seasick every day we were out there. For seven weeks, seven days a week, we were seasick. But even at that, it was a happy film. In the scene in which Captain Ericsson talks of his decision to depth charge some men in the sea, the head of Ealing Studios, Sir Michael Balkan, thought that Hawkins had gone much too far by weeping. So the scene was shot again, this time without tears, despite the protests of my father and the director Charles Friend. Then from America came Harold Daff of Universal Pictures to see the completed film, and my father showed it to him with the original vetoed take. And at the end of it, this book Harold Daff said, that's a great movie. It's got balls, especially that scene where Jack cries. There was a submarine there. I'm sure of it. It's where a submarine making an attack would have been. And if it was a submarine, how many more men and ships would it have killed? I had to do it. Anyway, it's all in the report. It was my fault. I identified it as a submarine. If anyone murdered those men, I did. No one murdered them. It's the war. The whole bloody war. 
1954 and again in 1955, Hawkins was voted Britain's most popular male star, and even to his own total astonishment, was regarded as a kind of muscular sex symbol. But this sort of stardom, though sometimes an embarrassment to his family, had little effect on Hawkins himself. I mean, if you talk about stardom in the boring sense of somebody who wants uh, their caravan to be longer than anybody else's or takes out tape measures when they measure billing, no, Jack had none of that. He's, he was above that crap, you know. One of the more tiresome aspects of fame was that uh, frequently when we'd be just crossing a pavement, he would be mobbed and the family would wind up having to go back home ahead of him. I think he enjoyed it enough to for him to feel that the, the price was worth paying. For example, we used to go down to a beach near Stadland Bay in, in Dorset. And um, we'd get down there on the beach and all collected together. And if Jack was there by some happy chance for the weekend, within no time at all, you know, there'd be crowds of people uh, wanting autographs or wanting to talk to him. And in, in no time at all, we'd be sort of exhibition A on the beach. The stardom accruing from the cruel sea brought Hawkins more than mere public adulation. It also brought him the offer of a long-term contract with the rank organisation at a salary that he couldn't afford to turn down. Perhaps he felt then that rank would build his career in a way that Corder had failed to do. Indeed, for most of the time that he was under contract to Corder, he'd been loaned out at a profit to other companies. Still, his erstwhile employer let him go with this handsome testimonial. Dear Jack, he said, good luck. I'm the man who had a golden sovereign in his pocket and didn't know it. Having changed hands from quarter to rank, however, the Golden Sovereign found himself in much the same predicament as before, still being loaned out to other companies, on this occasion mostly American, though it was to be some years before he actually made a film in Hollywood. Well now, at this time, Hawkins' health was good, no trouble at all with his voice, and over the next eight years he made 15 films, mainly in modern uniform, though from time to time he cropped up in some historical epic or in some costume drama. And I remember him turning up as an archer with somebody. I don't mean what, the radio archer, I mean... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, Robert Taylors and Van Heflins and, and zooming around looking noble and became a kind of male Britannia. Jack never talked much about, that I knew of, about the science of acting. He wasn't at all, you know, elaborately method or anything like that. He took everything as it came and played in everything equally well. Well, he's a tremendously professional actor and would never start a day's work without being word perfect and his dialogue. Well, he did a lot of work with tape recorders and all long speeches he would record. And he'd go over and over. He'd work on his own a great deal. A very fine actor, I think, because he never overacted. He always underplayed, but that's my type of actor. Well, you'll be glad to hear that the new government is elected to stay in the Commonwealth, so, of course, we shall be carrying on as before. Very well, sir. What's going to happen to Captain Abram, sir? Oh, the new president has given him safe conduct out of the country. That's good, sir. Yes, but we um, had to compromise. Uh, General McClellan told me this morning that Boniface had demanded that you leave the country within 48 hours. The Hawkins family was completed in 1954 when their daughter Caroline was born. And yes, her father had a broken arm at the time, and no, there is no known connection between the two events. The Hawkins home was now at Roehampton, where they lived for 18 years. In 1958, rich and famous, he was awarded the CBE for his film work and was urged to go into tax exile, a proposal he rejected immediately. I suppose, first and foremost, we really loved England. We were very happy in our home. But I think it was mainly because of the children. We didn't want to uproot them. And then the thought of the two of us going and living in Switzerland. We'd been to visit friends who did live in Switzerland. We didn't fancy ourselves up a Swiss mountain, really. Besides, life up a Swiss mountain, all fondue, cuckoo clocks and numbered bank accounts would hardly have suited the Hawkins lifestyle. He was essentially an Englishman, and what every Swiss mountain signally lacked was that typical part of English life, the local pub. Hawkins simply had the Englishman's fondness for a pint. He was never a boozer, though he did have his moments. Peter O'Toole remembers a certain occasion on location abroad. Jack McGowan, the Irish actor, and myself and the Hawk were 
in the very far east. Well, it was a Muslim state and city, and it was dry, completely, not a drink. So I said to Jack, go and do your, your British acting and ring out the embassy, which he did. And the, the attaché said, well, you can drink here, but you have to be a licensed alcoholic. And McGowan and I put our heads together, and we asked if the embassy had a doctor, which they, indeed they did. So we finished out the three of us as licensed alcoholics. And we went to a place called the Mono... It isn't Monopoly, Mono... Forgive me, it's years ago. Monopole, something like that. Where we could get this amazing paint remover, fire water, in a, in, in a, a, a labelless bottle, and you carried it out in an anonymous khaki little brown paper carrier bag. <laughs> well, we finished up with our three chits proving we were alcoholics and all And slowly made our way to the airport and we were sitting in a park finishing the paint remover. And Jack looked at his license, his license to be an alcoholic and said, if they catch you sober twice, you get the f***ing thing endorsed. That was another thing about Jack, he, um, he, he somehow always had the pertinent remark, not the wittiest, not the, but it was, boom, pertinent. <laughs> what are you doing? I didn't give orders for a halt. In 1957, Hawkins' international stature increased considerably with the bridge on the River Kwai. This was shot, on his advice, in fact, in Ceylon, which he and Doreen had visited during the war. Come on. You keep walking on that foot, you'll bleed to death. Yes. You're going to leave me here. You stop, we stop. You can't study the layout of the bridge after dark. You've got to get there before sundown. When the job's done, who knows if we can return by this route or, or whether we could find you if we did. If you were in my shoes, Joyce, I wouldn't hesitate to leave you here, and you know that. He doesn't know it, but I do. You'd leave your own mother here if the rules called for it. You'll go on without me. That's an order. By 1959, Hawkins was well established at the top of his profession and earning £30,000 a picture. Not much more than peanuts, perhaps, compared with what the likes of Marlon Brando get nowadays, but pretty good money in its time. At that point, however, television was beginning to present a grave danger to the film industry, and Hawkins was persuaded to take a drop in salary to £20,000 a picture in exchange for a percentage of the profits. In retrospect, he felt this was a pretty shrewd move because it forced him to take a greater interest in production and also to realise that television was much more than some kind of mere fairground sideshow, but in fact grave competition to the cinema. What's more, he also made a brief foray of his own into TV, appearing in The Public Prosecutor and as King Magnus in The Apple Cart, before becoming involved in the Edgar Wallace series, The Four Just Men, in which his co-stars and partners were Vittorio De Sica, Richard Conte and Dan Daly. For this series, Hawkins adopted his film star policy and took a reduced salary in exchange for a slice of the profits. Now, this turned out to be rather a grave mistake because there were no profits. Mind you, Hawkins wasn't particularly concerned about that because money for its own sake was never anything that had bothered him very much. Yes. There's not much time, Costa. You've been tricked. I've checked that list of Nazis you got from Dr. Carl. Not one of those men was a Nazi. Most of them fought bravely against the Nazis. I don't believe you. How do you know that Dr. Carl was in that concentration camp? I've told you, we talked about the camp, about men we had known there, every detail of the life. Yes, it would be quite easy to find out that information, especially if he had worked at that camp. While making the Four Just Men series, Hawkins teamed up with Richard Attenborough, Brian Forbes and others to form allied filmmakers. The aim was both to gain control of their own careers and to raise backing to film The League of Gentlemen, which Forbes had written specifically for Hawkins, neatly reversing his typecast image. The comedy stemmed from the fact that you expected Jack to behave as though he was on the bridge saying, fire number two gun. You didn't expect Jack to be a cashiered army officer with a lot of seedy characters, you know. That's what I played on. And with your cooperation, I intend to rob a bank myself. And the pay, gentlemen, 100,000 pounds each.
It was during the filming of it that um, the doctors diagnosed cancer. Did he tell you about that? No, it was one of those sort of dreaded, unspoken things. I can pinpoint the actual day and the actual scene when we became aware of something wrong. And I remember his voice got steadily, steadily worse during the day. And then he disappeared for about three days. And I guess that's when he had the first treatments. Well, he was terribly upset and and depressed as any actor would be at having to let people down. That upset him very much. But the state of mind, both of us, was quite extraordinary because, I mean, when you hadn't even thought of such a thing, it comes as such an enormous shock. Of course, we all clammed up anyway because had it been generally known, he probably wouldn't have got insurance and we wouldn't have been able to finish the film. After the, the cobalt treatment, he had a long period of apparent freedom from Oh, it. yes, complete remission. We took a holiday in Italy. That's when I got him to take up painting, because he was not allowed to talk much. One of the great things was he had to rest his voice. But, of course, once he started work again, the painting went. But he, he did. He started work again, uh, oh, within, I suppose, six months, less. He went to Hollywood and made the film with Shirley MacLaine. That film was Two Loves, and most unusually, it showed Hawkins in a romantic role. I gave over trying to be happy and settled for being interested, doing a job. It wasn't bad, not at all. Except that time rushed on as if to drown me. Lately, I refused to be drowned. Now, look here. I wrote Laura three weeks ago. I told her straight, if she won't get a divorce, I'll get one myself, and I will. I love you. Two Loves didn't exactly have American studios clamouring for Hawkins' services, and he was soon back in Europe to film Lawrence of Arabia, during which he struck up a lasting friendship with Peter O'Toole. Indeed, they became such good friends that David Lean, the director, asked them not to see each other off set for fear that they would lead each other into bibulous habits. I had a reputation, and Jack had a reputation, and indeed, quite a lot of it had a reputation, none of it ill deserved. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what, was he the kind of guy who would ever turn up drunk on a set? Or no, I've never seen him, so. No, no. I've seen him take him drunk off a set once. Not many people have a destiny, Lawrence. It's a terrible thing for a man to flunk it if he has. Are you speaking from experience? No. You're guessing, then. Suppose you're wrong. Why suppose that? We both know I'm right. David Lean's fears were not entirely ill-founded. Hawkins and O'Toole spent a tired and emotional Christmas Eve in Seville, during the course of which Hawkins, who'd had his head shaved for the film and covered his baldness with a toupee offset, was taken by O'Toole and others to a local house, the kind which is emphatically not a home. Jack thought it was a very posh restaurant, because it was a rather elegant brothel, and had no idea that it was a brothel at all. And we're sitting there, and the hair was, was falling over his eyebrows by this time. And we were approached by a few little whores, whom Jack, in his courteous way, thought were nice ladies who were about for Christmas Eve. And he said things like, oh, well, very kind of you to join us, and do, do, do sit down. And at which point, one of the ladies grabbed at him, in a particular erogenous zone. And I remember... The look of total astonishment on the male battalion's face and the hair hat slowly <laughs> falling down over his eyes. <laughs> Henceforth, avoiding the doubtful influence of Mr O'Toole's company, except when they filmed Lord Jim together, Hawkins continued his dignified and successful progress through the first half of the 1960s, when he made 11 films and mostly avoided the typecast military image, except for an excellent performance in Guns at Batazi. This revolver is staying where it is until I see some signed order from a legal member of your government. All right, Colonel. Now get moving. Meanwhile, you might get your men to change that wheel. Perhaps one of the reasons for Hawkins' almost ceaseless activity at this time was his and Doreen's constant fear that one day the cancer might return. One fell into the awful habit of 
at least I did, listening to his voice, you know. And I guess he listened to it himself, and he was very conscious of it. He was, whereas before he hadn't been, he was very conscious of how it sounded, or, and times it would let him down a bit, you know. And indeed, towards the end of 1965, when Hawkins was working in Hollywood, the fear became reality, and his voice failed him completely. So I went over there, and we consulted all sorts of specialists there, but uh, they couldn't suggest anything particularly. And we felt, as always, it's the best thing to come home to the people you know who've been dealing with it before. He then said that he'd got cancer at the throat, and that if he didn't have the operation, he would die. And that really was the position. And he did actually, after that, say that if he hadn't had a family and a wife and everything else, he would have died. Because as far as he was concerned, an enormous part of his life, I think, um, as he saw it at that time, was over. And so in February 1966, no other alternatives being left to them, Doreen drove Hawkins to hospital in London for the operation to remove his larynx. On the way, a car shooting out of a side road almost crashed into them. Hawkins wound down the window and yelled, You bastard! And that, he reported later, was his last public utterance in his own natural voice. Amputation would have been infinitely more preferable. But to, for an actor to lose his voice, and Jack's was really rather a good voice and of a special quality. Um, well, there's just nothing to replace it. You sent him a cable after he had his laryngectomy, didn't you? I what, did. Yeah, what did, what did it say? Shut up. How did he react to that? He laughed a lot, but he couldn't laugh at it. He went... And then we finished up on a cruise together. I'd done my back in. I'd lost a vertebrae. And uh, we went to, on a cruise to Mexico together and wrote a script. And uh, he did the walking and I did the talking. And we got on quite famously. He started talking within three weeks, which was quite incredible. Started uttering his first words. We did it mainly on Guinness and champagne, I'm afraid. <laughs> what better? <laughs> well, you see, it all, it all, the esophageal voice comes from a belch. And um, he found that if he drank Guinness and champagne, it would produce the, <laughs> the right sort of burp. Within six months of the operation, supported no doubt by a goodly draft of black velvet, he appeared on the Simon D. TV show to prove to fellow sufferers that an affliction such as his was not insuperable. The esophageal voice may have been unfamiliar, but the pertinent remark was still in evidence. I think, really, I would like some very bright spark to invent silent movies. <laughs> Uh, it was such a marvellous thing to have done. And I may tell you, as soon as he was off, the phone never stopped ringing with people congratulating him on his sheer guts in doing it. Did he change much after that operation? Yes, he did. Uh, I think his attitude to life changed. Um, a lot of the striving went out of it. Um, I think he was so amazed to find himself still alive and able to lead a very full life. I think that amazed him. And what is more, he was amazed to be able to work still. He hadn't believed that would happen. You were the first person who offered him work in, in Great Catherine. Did you do that out of charity? Not in the least. Charity in the name of love, certainly. In the terms of handout, no, good God, he wouldn't have accepted it anyway. What kind of courage do you think it took Jack to go onto the set for the first time to make a film after he'd had that operation? They have a lot of courage. The cool Jack um, was on the end of the boo's voice and the trademark as much as his acting. And for suddenly to lose that. And to know that he was struggling for every word. He must have had a lot of guts. We had um two marvellous actors who dubbed for him after the laryngectomy and I shall be eternally grateful to them for the work they did, Charles Gray and Robert Rearty. Uh, they did a marvellous job but for Jack it was terrible, terrible frustration, awful to watch. 
The first film that you dubbed for him, I think, was Shalako. Was that easy? Well, no, because we hadn't done it before. And uh, so we all set out one evening, and we had a run at it. It wasn't entirely successful. Charles, they'll hear you. Let them hear me. Don't you realize that we haven't enough funds to get back to England? And even if we did, we'd probably be arrested for debt. You can be arrested for debt, my love. Was he actually trying to use his own voice and therefore gulping? Yes. We came to a sort of arrangement. I said, um, if you could possibly not actually try and vocalize and just mime, you know, what you're saying, which is an awful thing to say to an actor. It's like, you know, telling a dog not to bark when it hears the dog go. And then it was much easier because it didn't have those unnatural lulls in between the next burst of speech. As to the funeral plans, for God's sake, Vladimir, but you need to know. The funeral train will consist of 11 cars. So he continued playing small parts in films and tried his hand as a producer for Peter O'Toole, though he found the work extremely arduous. He had an extraordinarily brave face. In fact, the last time we saw each other properly was in the south of France, falling about around a swimming pool. Um, having just then produced Ruling Class, which again was an agony to him because he couldn't communicate immediately um, to the director or to the wardrobe or whatever. And, and he was husbanding that one, so not playing any roles at all. He became uh, introverted, perforce, isolated, perforce, lost what he was on earth for, which was to act, you've heard that voice, couldn't um, do the... the uh, the bits and pieces that the, the production requires because it needs immediate talking. Um, and became sad, really, and, and depressed. He was a man of always great courage, but he showed such enormous guts over this that one had to be strong to... I guess we held each other up over it. In 1971, on a rare public appearance, Hawkins received a standing ovation when he presented one of the BAFTA Film Awards. I am to uh, pronounce the nominations for the most British, no least the most promising newcomer. Unfortunately, my name is not there. In the spring of 1973, Jack Hawkins came here to the Flower and Fifth Hospital on New York's Fifth Avenue to find out whether he was a suitable candidate for a voice back. This was a device that Dustin Hoffman had told him about, and if the operation was successful, it could be fitted into his throat and would at least partially restore the power of speech. He'd been warned by many of us that it was highly dangerous. And I think Jack finally had had it and thought, I don't, I can't, I've got to stop. I've got to risk this. Well, I don't think he went into it with the idea of dying, but he went into it with the idea of being prepared to die rather than to go on in, the, in this crippled fashion. Yes, humiliating and indignity. He'd had enough. When the surgeons operated upon him, they found in his throat a new growth, a primary growth. And so first they had to remove that and then wait for the wound to heal before they could go ahead with fitting the voice back. Now, initially, the doctors thought this was only going to be a temporary setback. But when she heard about the discovery and removal of this new tumour, Doreen Hawkins became understandably alarmed. So she flew to New York to stay at the home of her friend, Lauren Bacall, in order to be near her husband. I went straight to the hospital, and there he was, looking very, very good. But he got this thing in his neck, uh, which was a sort of temporary device. And was allowed to come out some two or three days later. He'd contracted a huge infection in, the, in this um, aperture they'd made. And uh, in the end, we had this, in the middle of the night, this terrible, terrible hemorrhage, which finally turned out the carotid artery had broken down. And he almost bled to death, so it was quite desperate. Ambulances and everything in the middle of the night in New York, and he was 
carted off to hospital again and given blood transfusion. I mean, it was a, an appalling mess. And I, I dropped everything, and uh, the American uh, embassy were wonderful. I mean, they just slammed a visa in, and I was over there within 48 hours. How did he look then? Older. A lot older than I'd seen him. You know, I suddenly realised he'd become a very old man. And Nicky and I brought him home to England, where the same thing happened all over again. Within a week, he had another terrible hemorrhage. And he went into St. Stephen's Hospital, and where they fought and fought and fought for him. Marvellous, marvellous they were. But it was unfortunately never any good. It was in St. Stephen's Hospital that Hawkins died a few days after yet another hemorrhage. He was reading a script almost to the time of his death, still convinced that he would work again. Four months later, a film tribute was held for him at the Odeon Cinema Kensington. His family and friends were there, and the proceeds went in part to the National Society for Cancer Research. Jack Hawkins was one of a kind, as all movie stars have to be, or they simply don't get to be movie stars. But he also represented a certain type of able and always reliable British leading man. And in a sense, he was the last of that particular rugged breed. What he portrayed up there on screen was strength and all those qualities that we believe, or anyway used to believe, epitomised the British character. Courage, sincerity, honesty, loyalty. He was the archetypal English warrior, the archetypal English gentleman. And by all accounts, he carried these characteristics over into his private life as well. The courage that he showed in facing the crippling handicap of losing his voice through cancer is difficult for an outsider to evaluate, but by any standards it must have been immense. When he died on July the 18th, 1973, at the age of 62, he left a will to the gross value of little more than £13,000. Not a lot for a man whose professional career had begun at 13 and who had made 66 films. Well, today, no doubt, there are people who would say he was a fool not to have gone into tax exile to protect his capital. But that just wouldn't have been the Hawkins way. To go into exile for no better reason than to make money simply wouldn't have been the act of an English gentleman. Jack, more than any other man, put the stamp of English acting at its most red-blooded and clear and passionate and gave a, a, a different interpretation of the, of, of the cliché Englishman of uh, phlegmatic and upper lip. Discipline and procedure are just as important as courage and skill. Every man and woman on this station has a part to play and a strict set of rules to play it by. I warned you before that we don't take kindly to people who break the team's rules. The others are only trying to help you do your job and it's up to you to help them do theirs. Yes, sir. All right, you can go. Baird, come here. Have a cigarette. 